The Fretboard Journal podcast is brought to you in part by our friends over at Retrofret Vintage Guitars. Retrofret always gets the cool stuff, and this week is no exception. Currently, they have for sale a Paramount Style A five-string banjo. You do not see those too often. They have a Recording King Ray Whitley Jumbo from 1940. Those are incredible Gibson-made guitars, and if you haven't played one, you owe it to yourself to uh, try one out. They are truly incredible. They also have a tenor Gibson TG25 with a lovely cherry sunburst for sale and an exceptionally cool 1957 Fender Studio Deluxe high steel guitar. If you have a 20th century modern house or just love um, beautifully designed things, that is a guitar that will fit equally as well in your living room as well as your recording studio. It's got the legs. It is gorgeous. Retrofret is diverse to say the least. Go to RetroFred.com and see for yourself. You can check out their whole inventory there. And don't forget that once this crazy storm leaves the East Coast, you can always send your guitars to RetroFret for repair and restoration. They do exceptional, world-class work. Welcome to the Fretboard Journal podcast and a very happy new year to everybody. I am Jason Verlindi, the publisher of the Fretboard Journal. I hope everyone had a great holiday season I hope our East Coast friends are staying warm and safe. I hope you have not neglected to humidify your instruments. I know it's a pain in the ass, but so is paying a luthier to repair your guitar. So um, it's probably too late to give you any advice on this stuff for those of you on the East Coast. But I hope hope you did the right thing. I'm sure you all did. Uh, Today, legendary bluegrass musicians Dell and Ronnie McCurry are our guests on the podcast. I wasn't here for this one. Scott from the Journal helmed down the interview with assistance from our dear friend Mark Demeray, who is a true bluegrass fanatic and guitar nut. I hope you like their conversation. And uh, if you do like our podcast, please share it with your friends on social. We always post every podcast on the Fretboard Journal Facebook page, although I'm guessing not a lot of you see all of our posts because that's the way Facebook works these days. They only want to show paid posts and political posts, it seems. But um, you can go onto our Fretboard Journal page on Facebook and find it and share it with all of your friends. You can also subscribe to all these podcasts via Apple Podcasts or via Stitcher or any number of other apps. So um, join us, won't you? Uh, Every little bit helps, and we have an action-packed year in store for you. Um, So I hope you will stick around. We have a lot of cool stuff to unveil. If you are a bluegrass or acoustic guitar fanatic, our other sponsor today is right up your alley, Dying Breed Music. Lane over at Dying Breed specializes in acoustic flat top guitars, mostly from the golden era. And right now he has a 1942 Martin D18, a long scale 1934 Martin 0018 with all original parts and a setup by John Arnold himself. And he's got a more recent guitar this week, a Froggy Bottom Deluxe SJ from 2016, just a couple years old. You can see Dying Breed's entire inventory over at DyingBreedGuitars.com. Or, you know what, you can just call Lane directly. He is one of those rare guitar store owners who craves and cares about customer service. And his number is 870-818-3434. He would love to talk to you about the guitars he has in stock and his consignment program and a lot more. If you do reach out to him, please tell him the Fretboard Journal sent you. Okay, on this end, beyond all that, uh, we've wrapped up our 41st issue. It's going to be mailing to everyone later this month. I'm really excited about that. If you have not subscribed to the Fretboard Journal print magazine yet, you still have time. Go to fretboardjournal.com. Click on the subscribe button, and if you use the coupon code PODCAST, uh, you will save five bucks off your order for any one, two, or now three-year subscriptions that we're offering. Those are my plugs for today. I hope you enjoy this fun conversation with Dell and Ronnie McCurry. I could listen to Dell tell stories all day long, but we got an hour out of him. That's pretty good. Uh, Hope you enjoy it. Thanks so much for tuning in. Welcome to the Fretboard Journal Podcast. We have Dell and Ronnie McCurry with us today. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah. Um, we're here in the uh, Triple Door in Seattle before the show. Um, thanks for taking the time, and hopefully uh, it stays quiet for us. Apologies if we get some interruptions, but should have some time. So uh, you guys are on the bus. How's it feel to be on the bus? I heard you. I heard this is a, a, a rare treat for you guys these days. <laughs> it kind of is, you know. We, uh, usually when we put the Triple Door, we fly out to Seattle to SeaTac and come up here, or <laughs> Portland, you know, it's according to where... But yeah, we haven't bussed for a while now. I don't know when we bust like. Well, we do once in a while though. Back back east, you know, we'll bust. But 
it's just according to how uh, how the dates are located, you know. <laughs> Is it a blast from the past, or are you ready for it to be in the past? <laughs> <laughs> oh, the bus, you mean the yeah, bus yeah, yeah. from the past? I guess you could say it is, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, with the bus, uh, now with an airplane, you never have to take a toolbox with you or anything. You know? <laughs> but with the bus, <laughs> the driver's got to have a toolbox because things happen to buses on the road. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> that that's no stranger to driving the bus out here himself. We've done it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No. Well, we played in Seattle before, and he's yeah. Your driving days are uh, are gone though. <laughs> My wife made me quit. <laughs> <laughs> They're smart sometimes. <laughs> Usually, um, I still have the bus. It's sitting there at the home. So let's. Uh, so let's. Does the bus allow you to bring? Um, this is the fretboard journal, so we have to talk about instruments. Does the bus allow you to bring um, more um, more instruments on the road with you, or instruments you wouldn't necessarily if it you were flying? Does, don't it? It, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean. Except for this trip. See, we had to fly to... Where did we fly to? Oh. We flew to Oakland. Oakland. Where we started mm -hmm. them And then leased week. the bus out here. You know. Got it. So you, but, you still had to fly with instruments. Yeah. Yeah, yeah still we, had to fly with them. But yeah, if you're busing, you know, you can. You can take uh, as many instruments as you want and a lot of product, you know, whatever, you know, boxes and boxes of it. But Yeah. But it does limit you, you know, when you fly. So what did you bring? Oh, let's see. For, let's see. We brought one. No, we brought, what guitar did you bring? Oh, which guitar? Yeah. Oh, I brought. I got a forty-seven D twenty-eight. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've just been playing that one for maybe. It's not been a year, has it? I I got it. My wife saw it in advertising the paper in Illinois, and so she called the guy, and uh, he said, "Yeah." She didn't know where he lived. It was just an ad, you know. And, and he said, she said, well, I'd like to come look at it. Where do you live? And she, he said, Illinois. Oh, I can't come up there. She said, <laughs> so he said, well, look, I'm going, I'm going to Bristol, which he, he'd come right through Nashville to go to Bristol, you see. And he said, I'll bring it by there. And you can look at it, you know. And he brought it by, and, and she bought it. And then uh, he had bought the thing new this guy had, and he bought his wife a brand-new Martin Manlin at the same time. And they were a duet, you know, and then his wife died, and he put both instruments under the bed and never played them again. He kept, he kept them because he thought maybe his son, he had two sons, I believe. He thought they might be interested in playing, but they never were. So he, he sold it to her then, you know. And for some reason, I never played that guitar. I don't know. And then I got it out one day, and I think I put strings on it, and I played it, and I thought, you know, this is a good guitar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the thing that stands out for me there is your wife bought you a guitar. How many guys out there wish that was the case for them? <laughs> My first one that, that I had, she bought. She bought it. It was a 56 D28. <laughs> she saw it in a... She saw it... Uh, you know these little Polaroid snapshots? Or, it was on the billboard where she worked. Just with a thumbtack, you know, stuck in the... And, and she knew the guy had owned it, and she bought it from him. And I think she gave him two hundred fifty dollars for it. It never been played. And what year was that? Though? That would have been. See, it's a '56, and I think that might have been '66. Mm -hmm. It's about ten years old when when she bought it, and uh, I played that one more than any that I ever had. That one, that one right there. Mm -hmm. You still have that one? You still got it? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, I recorded quite a bit with it, and but it's funny, you know. I, a lot of times I'll play one for a while, then I thought, well, I'll get this one out and see what it's, <laughs> it sounds like, you know. And uh, but I've got some D18s, and uh, that I I tell you what, I was going to record the first time in Nashville, I think, and uh, this guy had one for sale, and oh. Uh, 36 model D D18 and and Jerry Douglas said you need to go buy that guitar before we record you know so I went and bought it then from the guy he's, he's down there south of town somewhere and uh, I played that thing for years I did I recorded with it and played with it it's the least little neck in it you know 
And uh, then I got another 1936 with a great big neck. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Complete opposite. And they're both, the numbers are pretty close together. <laughs> Now, one of those 36s you have, the D18, has that kind of dark top on it. You know, was that the first one you bought? or that It was. Some, yeah. That was the first one I bought. Uh-huh. That was the one I was just telling you about. Yeah. Yeah, I played that in, uh, for quite a while. And, uh, what's that guy's name in Nashville? He lives in Florida now. He, he had it at one time because he dealt with... The first time I saw that was in Maryland, that mm-hmm. guitar. And so, Pete Ross. Pete. Pete. Pete, mm-hmm. Pete Ross. Pete Ross in, in Virginia had it. Yeah. And then he sold it maybe to a guy named Mike Armistead in Nashville. And then Mike sold it to Mike Dowling. Do you know Mike Dowling and all? Hmm. He's a great guitar player. Uh, yeah. He lives in, where's he live then? Is it in Idaho? It's one of these. Yeah. I think it's Idaho. Yeah. Montana or Idaho or something. He's, mm-hmm. but. Uh, and that's who you got it from? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, we, we looked it up a little to see if there was, you know, there's a couple of folks that have access to the old Martin records, and um, uh-huh. we looked that one up to see if it was labeled in the records as a dark top, but it was not. Although they tell us they don't all, they didn't always mark them whether they had mm-hmm. a shaded or a darker top on it or not. So, yeah. But it's a unique one. I mean, a lot of people have asked about that guitar because <laughs> it has yeah. that kind of darker color spruce on the top there and we wondered if you knew more about that one no you know i never did know a whole lot about it now uh the 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 last guy now i'm trying to think of you know uh god what's his name he he had it too before i think maybe before mike dowling um yeah he used to deal in banjos you know and Perkins? Perkins. Oh, yeah, Larry Perkins. Larry Perkins. He had it at one time. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, see, I never knew this because I never asked Larry about the guitar, but he told me, he said, you know, Lester Flatt had that guitar at one time. And I said, no, I didn't know that. And he swears he did. Now, the only person would know is if Josh was still here, he'd know. (laughs) Josh Graves, yeah. (laughs) Because, yeah, go ahead. He found it for him, didn't he? He found the D-28. Oh. He was playing the old D-18 when, in Wheeling, West Virginia, and he found in a pawn shop or somewhere, Josh found this D-28, an old, an old D-28. Keith's got that now, don't he? Maybe. Oh, well, he's dead now, but Keith wound up with it. Keith. Oh, Keith Whitley. Yeah, mm, that yeah, D-28. Yeah. But he said that, or I mean, Josh, he, he went to Lester's hotel room, and he said, Lester, I found a guitar for you, you know. Oh, you should get up out of bed and go look at this guitar. <laughs> Lester said, this better be good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He bought it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the D28, that is, you know. But there is some early pictures of Lester, <laughs> and he's got a dark D18. And... Who knows? But it's, yeah. you know, it was <laughs> pretty beat up. Yeah, it could be the same, not the same one you, you yeah. had. Yeah. It could be the same one. Yeah. It could be. Yeah. I, we don't know, you know. Yeah, we don't know. I never saw a good picture of Lester playing one, you know, back in those mm-hmm. days. Doe, what do you look for in a guitar? Or what, what makes them stand out to you and, and, uh, and stay in the rotation? Well, it's just a tone. Yeah. You know, you can some, uh, and I'll tell you what, too, uh, if they'll stand up to other instruments, you know, and and blend in with them and not, uh, and if you, you know, there's times when you'll play them hard and, and they have to hold up to that too. And a lot of guitars won't. You can play them hard and they just buzz out on you, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and I, I look for that, you know. Uh, but most, most Martins, you know, especially the older ones, they, you can't hook them up wrong. You can play them soft, you can play them any way you want to, and they're gonna perform, you know, just like you want them to do. They do. Now, we heard you talking years ago about a 1939 Herringbone D28 that Bill Monroe had yeah. when you played in the early days. Tell us what you remember about that one. Well, you know, uh, uh, 
You started with him in 63, was it? Yeah, I only played that year, okay. from February to February, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I played it, and <laughs> I'll tell you a funny thing about it. it uh, back then, we used those clamps, capos, you know. We call them a clamp. Mm -hmm. And and it had that little piece of cork back there, and in, in the middle of that cork was a little piece of metal. <laughs> To hold the cork on, and some some of those guys earlier, you know, in the earlier years, the cork wore out. The metal was still there, and they still used it on that guitar. And that one, the A was so dug out in the back, and especially A and B, you know, <laughs> and 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 I couldn't get the strings to tighten up with a clamp, you know. And so I told Bill about, it and he said, uh, "Take it over there to." Uh, Oh, what's that old guy's name? Shot, was it Shot? Shot Jackson, yeah. Mm -hmm. Shot had a, uh, uh, he's building steel guitars in those days and had a shop, you know. So I took it up there to Shot, and, uh, yeah, I didn't fix that. So I didn't know what he'd do with it, but he filled it in with plastic wood, <laughs> I guess. That's all I know. And he made that neck just as slick, you know. <laughs> and and uh, then, um, uh, it had some scratches on the front, you know, way up here and down there, you know. <laughs> and one day I asked him, I said, Bill, I never did ask him a whole lot about the guitar, but I did ask him about that. And he said, ah, that's a Lester Flat with that old thumb pick. <laughs> you know, he go away like <laughs> But that was a good sounding, it was a great recording guitar. Well, it was good all around, but it was... Uh, when it got gone, Bill said, well, there goes our sound. He was used to the sound of that special guitar, you know. Mm -hmm. So that got stolen or something, as I as I recall the story? Or? Well, I don't know if I should repeat. I heard something well, do with, I, I heard something to do with Pete. Yeah. It out when yeah. Or yeah. <laughs> well, Pete told us that. He, oh, said, yeah. he said he was at a party in Nashville, and, uh, and when, he went start, when he went home, from the party he'd forgotten, he left it there at the party. And which, you know, for a young guy like we were back in those days, it'd be easy to do. <laughs> and he went back for it. He thought, I better go back right now. And he went back and it was gone and nobody knew anything. And nobody has ever saw it since then or no. It seemed like, you know, these days we'd have known the serial number, and yeah. I doubt they'd have been put plastic wood on the 39 herringbone these days <laughs> to fix it. <laughs> but, and but, it, it had a long pick guard. Yeah. <coughs> and uh, uh, it, did have, it, it did have its own tone. Mm -hmm. it, I've never heard one sound just like it. And if I heard it today, I think I'd know it. You'd know it, huh? Yeah. I think I would, or if I played it today, you know, I think I would know the tone of that thing. <laughs> you talked about the G string. When you'd hit the G string, uh, yeah, you said it would. It would just. It wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't ring out long, you know. Oh yeah, the the strings. If, when you play them, you know they die out quick, but mm -hmm. they pop right out there and back again, you know. <laughs> it it was a good one. Yes, it was, and it noted good. <coughs> you know, it noted in in tune and. Uh, Back then, I was using uh, heavy gauge strings. <laughs> we were, all of us were. <laughs> and, and it's one of the necks would stay in them, you know, but they did. Mm -hmm. I remember I used those. Uh, Bill Keith would bring me strings from Boston. Now, what was the name of that outfit? They were. Not Black Diamond or one of those guys? No, it wasn't. I used to use Black Diamond on a banjo that I played banjo before, you know, and mm -hmm. I used Black Diamond, but. Uh, and strings like long, no, uh, no, I know when you're talking about euphonin or something, euphonon or whatever they call uh -huh. it. Uh-huh, I used them for a while. It was a labella, was it? Wait a minute, labella, no. No, I don't think it but was. But they were the heavy gauge ones you all Heavy gauge, yeah, I used uh, all the time and, and, uh, but it was, it was one of those special guitars, you know, it's a shame. And you know, it's funny that nobody knows where it's at. Nobody has ever said a thing about that guitar. And I, I think it might be in Japan, you know. That could be. A lot of those have resurfaced, but I, I know, you know guys know Robert Bolin. He had one that was stolen 
like 30 years ago and he just found it again. It was yeah, the same kid. guy had it all those years. He told us that. He didn't, we saw, he heard that story. Really? Yeah. So well, if anybody do, knows where it is, email they us. They pop it up. Yeah. yeah. If anybody knows where the 39 is. Oh, 39 yeah. airing ball. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Come on, somebody's got to know. many of them left. <laughs> yeah. so you maybe well, I bought one up. of my D18s from Robert. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. the other 36. Uh, yeah. Big neck. The, with the big neck, which is a good, good guitar. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, so in more recent years, you did yeah. a project with Martin Guitar to make your own Del McCurry model. Tell us a little bit about working with Martin, and uh, and did you work with Dick Boak on that project? or who was Yeah, it? sure yeah. did. Yeah. Dick, he's great, you know, and, and I just saw Dick recently. Where did I see him? I think he just he's retired. Ret or, yeah, yeah, he told me he was going to or he is retired. Mm -hmm. But... but uh, he and uh, uh, Larry? Mm -hmm. Larry, yeah, Larry, Larry Barnwell. Barnwell. Yeah. yeah, they, they. I guess Larry was the one that told me about that they were going to build a signature model, and that uh, I had to tell them. Or, oh, Richard Starkey, he lives down south of town, yeah. and they said, "What would you like? You know, the, the guitar to, to feel like? You know, the neck and all that? You know." And at the time, I was used to playing that 56 model, I think, again. And I, So I took it down there, and Richard, he measured everything and made the necks just like that, you know, just like that 56 model. And uh, I put that blue lapis in the, for the dots in the neck, and um, what else did they do? I forget exactly. Uh, you know... Uh, Evan's playing one now, ain't he? Mm -hmm. Evan's playing one. That's my grandson. Yeah, there. he said that he had that one. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> and, and, but I played one probably for a year, and it sounded great, you know. It did. Uh, but they made 115 of those, I think. And I have, I think I bought a couple of them back from people that, bought them and then never did play you know mm -hmm. and they'd have them for sale mm -hmm. and i think i bought a couple of them back but they sold them all pretty quick yeah mm -hmm. they have to have given you one for putting your name on it i suppose they do <laughs> 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 yeah. and then you have a D, deal yeah you got the 18 model too after him yeah. yeah when when i had been playing music 50 years i think they thought they said they'd make 50 of them and and uh but I think they just made the D18s kind of like the, what they were making it. They're not, uh, wait a minute. No, I'm, they gave me one for my birthday, and the 75th birthday that I played quite a bit. It's called a, uh, hmm, what's that thing called? 30, that's like a 30, he was born in 39, so it's a 39. Yeah. One of those authentic ones? Mm. That's yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, that's what that one's called, yeah. That's a good guitar. Mm -hmm. I played that thing. Hmm. A couple years, huh? I've been, I had been playing that. When I started playing this one. Right up to this you. This one out. Yeah. yeah. I had. How many guitars do you think you have, Dale? I, I, uh, see, I've counted one time. <laughs> I think about 20. Huh. I think I have about That's 20. That's all? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's all. <laughs> and how many did your wife buy? <laughs> play. You say play. No, no buy. buy. Oh, buy. No, she bought two of them. Oh. Yeah, she, no, wait a minute. No, she bought she bought a couple that I never played <laughs> since then, you know. She saw one in Madison, Tennessee, advertising. She went down there and bought it. Yeah. Uh, that, was a, that was a, a, newer, a newer, newer signature model. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then she bought a, she bought several. <laughs> now, Ronnie, um, we were chatting and we told you to stop and save it for the podcast. Uh, pretty good story about a lorry you uh, you've come across. Yeah. You want to tell us about it? Yeah, <laughs> sure. Um, but then got Rob here too. He can tell about his banjo. Um, well, in I don't know now how many years it's been. Well, probably it's about eleven or twelve. Something like that. I uh, got a call from a fella uh, in L.A. Uh, it was a recording engineer named Jeff Peters, and he was had a Lloyd Lourdes that he was thinking about selling, and he contacted me, and you know I didn't, 
I, I, it wasn't the first one I've been contacted about, but, but my parents said, well, maybe you should go look at it. <laughs> so the guy come to Nashville, I met up with him. Actually, yeah, me and Evan, <coughs> me and Evan went down there that time, and yeah, I think he was, well, I guess he was about nine or so. <laughs> and, He's a kid, wasn't he? <laughs> and, uh, I wasn't sure if he knew what he had because I just didn't know, you know. And I got to the motel room and there was the case. And I thought, well, that's a case. <laughs> and we sat and talked for about an hour before I even actually uh, opened it up because he's a in really interesting fella and, you know, has re recorded a lot of people. and. I bet you was dying to look at that thing. I was. I was, <laughs> I was trying to just ease into it here. He op opened the case up and there it was. It was an, everything original. Um, I've said before that that tailpiece is, is, is more pristine than a brand new tailpiece. It was that clean, you know. And it was in Mexico. It was in no no galleys, no galleys, or whatever. So is it stamp made in USA on it anywhere? The headstock usually <laughs> often they did that with an export one. They, had they did, but it. see this this fella was uh, I think he was an American living down there. Okay. So he, he took uh, it down with him, maybe. He must have taken it there uh, because it was Jeff's wife's uncle. He told me she remembered. You know, my uncle had a mandolin and. I think that he uh, gave it to her as he when he got older, or or maybe it was in a will thing. I'm not sure, but they wound up with it. Of course, he knew his electric guitars more than anything's what Jeff was familiar with, and when he eventually found out what he had there with that lore, and uh, he brought it, and I checked it out, and of course I could the the back was separating the seam was. And the fingerboard was loose, <laughs> uh, but I could, you know, I knew it hadn't been played much. And usually, any instrument, vintage or not, that's not been played a whole lot, they don't really, you don't know what the sound's going to be, you know. And uh, so I didn't mess with it too much with the the way it was coming apart and this and that. And but I said, yeah, that's the real thing. And I called my parents, and they said. Well, uh, if you like it, then then maybe you could bring it home tonight. You know, <laughs> I said, well, he's, he's, they figured out the uh, payment deal with with uh, with him, and I brought it back, and they said, well, we'll just figure this up with the kids in the will. You know, and uh, if you like it, you know, keep it. And if you don't, then you could sell it. And at the point at that point, you know, the lures were at the peak. Yeah, they were peaking, uh, and and he was aware of values, obviously. When he he, he was, but it it was still kind of it was undervalued. Yeah, but it was a lot of money, <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, then anyhow, I got it, and Steve Gilchrist was in the country at the time, living in Missouri for a little while, and I I got it to him, and he's just a master that anything has to do with the Lloyd Lore, really. Mm -hmm. um, and he repaired it, and I got it back a couple of weeks later. And, I and mean, so the, he was in town, and he wasn't in Australia at that point? No, he time. wasn't. He was living in Missouri for about... He wound up living there almost a year or six months, something like that, and finding wood, you know. And uh, But he, he, we met halfway or something, and uh, fi he fixed it for me, and... And then, you know, I got it back, and I was kind of excited, but it was it was not really, it didn't sound that good to me, you know. It was, and Steve said it, it's like it's had open heart surgery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably. <laughs> he said it needs to. <laughs> it needs to heal, you know. And but I'll tell you, I think what was killing it, more than anything, was the original bridge. Because the bridge bottom was, I mean, as thick as my finger, you know. Oh, yeah. And uh, most of them, you you, know, you cut them to the ma get the mass out, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I had uh, I had some work done on it, but uh, by Dave Harvey, another guy there, Gibson, um, setting it up. And but 
I played it for uh, probably two or three years. I played it and recorded stuff with it, and it really recorded well and sounded sounds good. And you know, I I talked to some other guys who said I don't know. He said, I said, well, will it ever come out of it? You know, and that's before I really had some like the bridge done and all that. And I said, I don't know. It, it might be what it is, you know. But once you play an instrument. Uh, daily and like we do and travel and get into different climates and in that wood moves you know I, I think it really makes a difference and uh, so well it wasn't too long that it was really starting to sing that, and the reason I kind of put it down is it has a big neck and it's also the only one that I had ever heard of from all these guys too that told me this that has a slightly arched fingerboard. Really? Yeah, most yeah. of them are flat, is that right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's not, did you scoop the fingerboard? No, I'm not one that? of those guys that scooped, you know. I heard Reichman had another one put on his because he liked the arch and the scoop, so he just saved the original one. Yeah, no, that's on one of the, the finest part. ones. Yeah, he's that a good, is that's a good one. That's yeah. one of the top lures, <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. you know, uh, John's. but. Oh yeah, John. Right. So now you have a lore in the family. Yeah. But then somebody else is a banjo player. I mean, there's an old master tone floating around somewhere. Tell the story about how Rob's banjo came into the family. Uh, hey, Rob. Thanks hey, for joining us. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a few old master tones floating around in the family, but uh, <laughs> I guess my my pride and joy is uh, long about to not long. Actually, after he got his mandolin, I had, uh, we were playing in D.C. It was late at night. We we were done with the show. And Sonny Osborne knew I was kind of looking. And he called me about 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. He said, I found you one. And uh, uh, long story short, then uh, I talked to another guy that's dealt a lot of instruments, Larry Perkins. And he said, I know he's telling me, I says, it will come to find out it's the same banjo. And, and uh, it wasn't too far from Nashville, south of town, about an hour or so. Uh, we decided to meet down there at the guy's house. And it was, uh, it was an old original, you know, Gibson, original five string flathead, all there, you know. Been played a lot, but uh, anyhow, go down there to see this banjo and the guy who's selling it's a guy that i've known for about 25 years <laughs> <laughs> and uh but uh it had uh it had sold originally to a, a plectrum player in western pennsylvania and he ordered i don't know why he ordered a five string but he ordered the neck extra small because I guess because he played with a flat pick, you know. And uh, but they said he never used a fifth string, so I have no idea why he would have ordered a five string, you know, if he didn't need it. But uh, this guy, they said, played all the time, and uh, uh, I don't know his name. I can't remember right now. But uh, in 1958, the second owner acquired it, and it was in the newspaper. Uh, the guy had the, the original owner had got a brand new one. So he was going to sell his old one. So in 1958, it was in the newspaper for fifty dollars. <laughs> and uh, this. And your mom wasn't looking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that fella. So the second owner, then. Uh, long story short, he had it. Then Jim Mills acquired it. Then uh, Rodney Carter got it. The guy down in Alabama, and that's who I wound up getting it from. Uh, but that second owner, he had had it from 58 till, gosh, he owned it for, I don't know, almost 40 years. And uh, so he, he, he got in touch with me and he sent me all kinds of pictures and documents and things that he had on the banjo, you know, but uh, it's, uh, I guess that was a long story getting there, but uh, <laughs> anyhow, I wound up getting it, it's a, uh, it's a, a really late, uh, some guys call them a floor sweeper. It's a really late banjo that they were just about done with them. And uh, 
they say, well, George Gruen said it's in 1940, and you know other people have said that. But now there's all these new, new, uh, new information on these numbers that, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, it may be a little older, maybe I don't know. But anyhow, it's an original five-string RB75, and it's quirky. It's it's got the Master Tone label inside of it. It's in the on the wrong side. And, it's got a, it's a maple neck 75, which they were mahogany banjos generally. Um, but it's got a maple neck instead of a mahogany neck. And uh, it's inlaid different, but there, there are five of them include mine. There's five that I know of that are all the same. And I guess they, you know, they, when they'd get enough orders in, then they'd make a run of them, I guess, you know, and, uh, it's uh, it's got a really small neck. It's it's almost too small, up, you know, up by the nut, and uh, it's got a uh, although it's a flathead, it's got an arch top, five string tailpiece on it. Uh, it's got uh, the the coordinator rods inside. One of them is period correct. The other one was older. You know, <laughs> they were just I think piecing it together. The the original tuners were what you would see on the. Uh, on the on the twenties style banjos, you know, what they call a two tab, they they had two little bitty screws that held them in place and uh, as opposed to what everybody calls the pancake, the Grover tuner. Is that yeah. why they call them the floor sleeper, just whatever was around the floor that was whatever was left over. Clear the fridge party. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> but, uh, and oddly he uh, well a little more on it. His lawyer was signed April 25th, 1923, and I got my banjo on April 25th. And when I got it, we were playing a show at the, uh, was that with Charlie? It was, wasn't it? Charlie Daniels at the uh, Country Music Hall of Fame, and Earl Scruggs was there. And uh, the guy that I bought it from had never met Earl, so we set this up and said, well, look, Earl's going to be there. It's, we'll do the deal here, and you'll get to meet Earl. And... Uh, so uh, that all happened, and I showed Earl that banjo, and he hit it, and he said, "Would you take what you've got in it?" <laughs> well, he liked the neck. Yeah, he liked that neck. He said, "Well, that neck really felt good doing you." <laughs> and uh, and I actually took the resonator off and got him to sign the inside of the resonator that day, and he signed and dated it. So I know it. I just April, dawned on me. April twenty fifth. Mm -hmm. Really. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. So sometimes they find you, like instead of you guys finding the instrument. <laughs> yeah. They yeah. They do. That's yeah. true. Yeah, you're right That's about true. that. Yeah. Let's uh, yeah. let's switch gears now. We got more of the family here. Um, talk about Dell Fest. Mm -hmm. uh, something about bluegrass to me is just like it's a tighter community than a lot of other genres. It feels like to me. Everybody, everybody knows everybody. Everybody plays with everybody. It's just a it's a big happy group. Um, did that did did sort of that spirit inspire you guys to start Del Fest? How did Del Fest come about? Yeah, I think you're right about the the tightness, you know, of, of uh, bluegrass bands and musicians, you know, all through the years. Uh, but you know, when I first l started listening, uh, it was it was what you call a local music, you know. It wasn't widespread like it is now. Uh, there was uh, Bill Monroe on the he had the 50,000 watt clear channel radio station, you know, and he was on Decca Records, and of course he's the, the man that got it all started. And then there's so many side men that he had through the years, you know, that that work with him. Lead singers, guitar players, banjo players, and fiddlers, and just whatever, and they'd go off on their own, you know, to, to uh, start their own thing going, you know, and I think that's part of the reason for the tightness you know in the community although they had argued a lot <laughs> and fight too well, that's part of all families <laughs> but you know uh, I, I always wanted to I mean I, in the back of my mind I always would like to have a festival you know years ago when the, I played the first one Carlton Haney had in Virginia down there at Fincastle I didn't play the 65 when I didn't even know there was one but I did play in 66. Me and the dog. Dog was there. <laughs> and me and this fiddle player, Billy Baker, uh, we were good friends, had to work with Bill Monroe together. And we went down there. 
And uh, so David was there, and we got up and, and played a show. At the, we weren't booked there, but Ralph Fenster was running the show, and I knew Ralph. So I asked Ralph if we could do a, a show sometime during the weekend, you know. And, and he said, oh, yeah, I'll put you on tonight. So he did. He put his own. <laughs> and uh, uh, But to, to shorten the story up, then my manager in the later years, you know, he told me, he said, did you ever think about having a festival? And I said, yeah, but I don't want the headache, you know. I didn't. And he said, well, you wouldn't have to, uh, you wouldn't have to take it all on yourself, you know. You got people now to help you with all those things, you know. <laughs> of course, these guys were there, and, and he knew that with him and, and our booking agent and Gene and these boys and all like that, that we could make a go of it, you know. And so we started. And the thing about it was, though, we really didn't, I don't think we had a strictly a bluegrass festival in mind. It was just more of a, like a music festival, you know, because there's so many. I always like variety in in a record or anything, you know. I don't like listening to the same thing all the time, <laughs> except if it's if I want to hear a bluegrass band, I'll listen to Bill Monroe and Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs and Chubby Wise. <laughs> Yet. Ain't that funny? <laughs> we got Dell's Del Desert Island Disc. <laughs> <laughs> they really bit me hard back then, you know. But, uh, but as far as I do like a variety of stuff, you know, and, and these boys do too, you know. They used to listen to to the southern rock bands, didn't you? You know, then <laughs> I was going to ask you, you've, you've done some collaborations uh, with a lot of people outside of bluegrass. Is there a favorite you've... Uh, well, I don't know if there's a favorite. It's just that I thought, you know, I think I'd like to try that. <laughs> you know, and, and I, I never knew if it would work at all, but a lot of times it was my, I think for the most part, it's probably my manager's idea, you know, <laughs> to try new things like that, I believe. But, but at the same time, uh, we played uh, Bonnaroo, you know, and Stan told me, my manager, he said, you know what, if it hadn't been for Ronnie, the first year, we played it the first year that it was there. <laughs> he said, Ronnie kept telling me, we need to play that. Well, we were in California. <laughs> and, and I think we'd be back there Sunday, though, right? I think it was Sunday. We'd be back home. Well, uh, so they they got it done. They, you know, they, they booked us there. And, uh, and a lot of times... You know, Stan will listen to these boys too. He, you know that he knows they've got great ideas, and and so uh, then we just we had played for Roy Carter and Rebecca Sparks out in the High Sierra. You know, we'd played their festival, and they're great people. You know, they're really solid. And so Stan called Roy up and he said. Would you come here to the East Coast and look for a place for us to have a festival? And you can partner with us. So Roy called Stan one day and he said, well, we'll fly up to Baltimore and then we're going to start in uh, Cumberland, Maryland. And then he's got uh, New Jersey, I don't know, New England. <laughs> He'd looked, <laughs> he knew about places. So, but we went to Cumberland to the Allegheny County Fairgrounds there. and. And I told Stan, I said, you know what? I, I've played a lot of festivals, and I think this is, we're not going to beat this location. We didn't know about the people, you know, that we're going to have to be dealing with. But but as far as the location, that's what we were inter interested in. So we just settled on that. We didn't go any further. Well, that's <laughs> and, how I ended up in Cumberland. <laughs> yeah, that's how we wound up in Cumberland, you know. And, and we've been, you know, since then, a lot of other... Uh, communities have approached us about moving or having one in in another part of the country you know but we haven't done that yet you know I mean we won't move from there because we just now signed the five-year contract for for a while and for five years at least <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> now, you've been coming out to wintergrass here in Washington we as you guys know well, yeah since you come here a lot we have a very vibrant active bluegrass and old-time music community in the state of Washington and I see you're on the bill this year with Dog, Dell and Dog show and you guys did a CD together. Tell us about 
a little bit about your history with David and about that CD and the show we can look forward to at Wintergrass. Sure. Well, you know, I first met David when I was working for Bill Monroe. We played in New York City, and uh, he was going to uh, college there in, in, in the city. And uh, uh, so I didn't, I didn't even know he played music. You know, he's just, he was just a young guy. He's like you say, he'd go around with tape recorder, you know, and tape shows, and and uh, he was probably playing then, but he may not have been all that good. He he, he owed a lot of his uh, education with the mandolin to Ralph Rensler because Ralph, uh, let's see. His mom taught Ralph in school. I think that's the way it was. And so anyway, uh, then later on, my brother Jerry and uh, David were playing with the Red Allen and the Kentuckians. Red Allen and the Kentuckians, I think it was. And Porter Church had a great band, you know, <laughs> really hardcore bluegrass. And But David booked this show up in New York and uh, not Albany, across the river. It, it, uh, so anyway, he he told Jerry, he said, well, you think your brother would come play with us up there, you know? <laughs> he was looking. They had, Jerry was going to play bass, and David play the mandolin, and uh, Winnie Winston was a banjo player. And so they needed a guitar player, you know? I, and I had already quit Bill, and had been to California and back, and, and was working a day job, I think. But... I went and played with him. That's when I got to know him really well, you know. We went up there, and, and uh, then I might have seen him. i tell you, one time I was playing a festival later. I was playing a festival in Warrington, Virginia, and uh, I got done with my show like tonight, and I had to go to another show for tomorrow somewhere. And David walked up, him and this real black-headed guy, and, and he said, uh, I want you to meet my new banjo player. And <laughs> it was Jerry Garcia, you know. <laughs> and they said, uh, uh, David said, had, did, you, did you see Porter Church? Because we all liked his picking, you know. He was really good. And I said, yeah, he's got a little motor home up there. And he's, the, I just walked by there, and he was sitting on a step playing. And, <laughs> and I had to leave, and I took him up there. But for some reason... He wasn't there, <laughs> so I had to leave, and I don't know if they got to see Porter or not. I don't know if they did, but they'd played together before this, David and Porter Church, and uh, then he he moved to California, San Francisco, and I didn't see him uh, for years and years through that. Well, I guess we did. We, when we'd come out and play, we'd see him. We'd go. 1979, when you went to... Uh Japan, I guess. You stopped it there, and I don't know if you'd seen him in between, but... Uh, yeah, I think it might have been that long. Yeah. Uh, we, we, Herschel Sizemore was playing mandolin with me at that time, and, and we came back, uh, I think we played one show in Hawaii from Japan, and, and then we played a show in San Francisco, and uh, he wanted to interview Herschel because of his mandolin playing, you know? And he was there at that show. I guess he was playing this same show we were. I, I didn't hear him play, but that was probably about the first time I saw him after all those years. But then when we'd come out here, me and Ron and the boys, you know, Ronnie and Rob, well, we'd, he'd want us to come, and come to his house, you know, and, in our free time and record stuff, you know. <laughs> so we did, and we did that a lot. And uh, I don't know when we started doing that, do you? Probably, well, the, the Grispin Bluegrass Experience thing you did with him was in the late 80s. Was it? He come, used, it was called the David Grispin Bluegrass Experience. And, yeah, and, yeah. Which right. was basically uh, the, the tour, we could, did a tour and it was Dad's band with David. And yeah. I played uh, an extra guitar and... And mandolin. And some mandolin with David. Oh, yeah, I played twins, you know. We did that, we did that... Uh, for a year or something on and off or something like that mm -hmm. but that's uh that's when i probably the first time we got to i got to meet david and when we were when i was a teenager just learning to play the mandolin uh he had sent uh a box of some records in it and because 
He had just released this live show that Dad did. He was telling you about 1966. Was it Ithaca or was it? Oh, I forgot. Yeah. Troy, is it? Troy, Troy New, New York. York. Yeah. Uh-huh. And uh, he, yeah. so it was. It was called Early Dog. Was the name of the record. <laughs> and uh, along with that, he sent the records he had made up to that point. And this would have been like 1982 or three or somewhere like that. So. Uh huh. I never heard that music. I never heard the mandolin played like that, really. I was, because I was just listening to bluegrass mandolin players, Bill Monroe and Frank Wakefield and Bobby Osborne and Jesse McReynolds. And it was, I was kind of later when I discovered David and then a little bit later Sam Bush <laughs> for me. But um, that, at, not long after that's when we started doing a little music with him and he gave me the mandolin that I play today it was in 1981 Gilchrist and uh, still playing it and uh, but then I guess dad had recorded with David Home is Where the Heart Is it is a double disc he made of kind of came back and did bluegrass music after some dog music there and uh, dad played on that and sung and did a couple shows with him I think and um, then then like we said through the 90s we would come out and we'd stay with him and record stuff and um, and then skip ahead and now they're doing a, a duet show (laughs) <laughs> my manager called one time and, and he said uh, do, you, do you know anybody the, the, the guys you know these guys they're busy man they're on the road all the time and so they call them the traveling <laughs> that's, yeah. that's yeah. right yeah so so he known Stan he wants to get me out there he don't want me to sit down or do <laughs> so <laughs> He said, do you know of anybody that you just go out to, with the two of you, you know, that you would like to do? And I, and I told him, to, to those two guys, Sam, Bush, and David, you know. And for some reason, the way it worked out, I, I did a, a bunch of things with Sam first, you know. And, and uh, I don't know, I guess, I don't know why we quit. We, we, we quit, quit doing stuff. I, I can't remember why, but... Um, then he said, now, you know anybody else? And I said, well, David, but I don't know if he'd want to do that, you know. Uh, but I, I, I'd like to go out with David if I have to go out with just one guy, you know. <laughs> and so David said, yeah, let's do that. So <laughs> he, in the wind-up, I flew out and to when he, he was still living in Petaluma then. And I flew out, and, and we run through some songs, you know, and, and uh, he's all up he's all excited about it you know i was too you know but and and then so we with those songs that we worked up kind of uh we were doing them and we did a show in uh, new york city i think that was thing across the bridge from manhattan in uh, brooklyn Brooklyn, yeah place called the hall i believe the hall and we played there and um we didn't have our own sound, man. I did it first. I think the you guys sound guy went with with us for a while when he could, and then we just started going with whoever was there, you know. <laughs> and so uh, that night, uh, the guy that taped us, David said, "You know that I've listened to that tape, and it and it's really well done. You know, I mean, the thing about it is." Uh, the sound was there for both of us. We just used one mic, you know, to play and sing into. And he said, it, the quality's there. Of course, I was using this mic that I endorsed. And God, he got to loving that microphone for that mic. He said, it, but it would really eat that old lower up, you know. <laughs> he had his own that he played mandolin over for years and years. I don't know what it's called. And... <laughs> and he got to liking this <laughs> Mike Tech. Mike Tech. And he'd say, Let's just use that one. I said, I don't care. <laughs> well, then that's what we did and, and so we played over there and the the, the tape or the uh well he gets gets it on I don't know what he he gets it these days. I don't I don't know that much about taping but uh 
what does he call them things? Anyway, he knows all about that. And he'll ask the guy if he's got this thing, you know, every night we play because he wants a tape of it. And if he can't get a tape, he's really upset. <laughs> yeah, and he got it, and he told me, he said, uh, now I want you to, li I'm going to send this to you, and I want you to listen to it, you know. <laughs> and tell me what you think. And so I called him up, and I said, David, i tell you what, I messed up some guitar places, you know. No, it's just live. Don't worry about that. Did you listen to my mandolin playing? And I said, well, you played good. <laughs> and I kept complaining about this thing with the guitar. <laughs> and at the end of the conversation, he said, all right, I'm going to ease your pain. <laughs> I'm going to fix that. <laughs> I don't know how he'd fix it. <laughs> But he, he did. He fit. well. I don't think he had to do much with it. You know, it was just it was just there. It was all right there. You know, and we do the singing. You know, duet singing, and and it was just it's a fun thing to do. You know, he, but he's he wants to do another record now. Do it. <laughs> the one yeah. time we were in his studio, out. we're waiting for it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we were in California recording. You know, Ronnie said, David. Uh, I don't know what you said to him, but it, uh, and David said, hey, man, it's your record. <laughs> <laughs> Do what you want to with it. <laughs> he said, hey, give me, a, give me a piece of tape and a, and a razor blade, and I'll make you a record. <laughs> well, Dale and uh, Robbie and Ron, it sounds like they're uh, trying to get you guys to play a show here tonight, yeah. uh, so we should probably let you go, but it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for chatting, and uh, we'll oh, see yeah. you at Wintergrass. Hey, enjoyed it, man. Thank you so Thank much. You so much yeah. yeah.